to see so many people here today. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm Nora Roper. I'm the assistant plant manager at the Corvette plant, which means I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day business of running the plant, so production, maintenance, and central engineering. And I'm excited to share some news about the plant with you. I've got three major topics today. First of all, if you didn't hear, the plant was hit by a tornado. So I'm going to talk about that tornado recovery. And then secondly, with our Z06 LT6 engine that is hand-built in the Performance Build Center in the plant, I'm going to be focusing on some unique processes that we have for our LT6. Some of you might have been here this morning. I was here to hear Jordan Lees talk about the LT6. He focused on the product side. I'm going to be focusing on the process side of building those engines. And then the third topic, as usual, we have new paint colors for 2023. So we've got a few parts that uh, we brought here. And Chuck Valentini, our paint and body area manager, is here again. And we'll be talking about those new colors. But before we get started with the agenda, something special happened on Monday. Some really big news for GM and Corvette. So if you didn't hear, I have a little video to show you. but it really gave us some information there. Our GM president, Mark Royce, announced on Monday that there's more future for Corvette, it's gonna be electrified, and it's, there's be a fully electric Corvette. So I'm sorry I don't have more details than that, it's just a teaser, uh, but uh, that's pretty exciting about Corvette. Okay, let's talk about the tornado recovery. So back, Early morning, it was a Saturday, very early in the morning on December 11th, we had a storm system come through and the plant was hit by the tornado. But the very next day, you know, on the 12th, we already had uh, resources arriving, so I'm going to talk about that. And we were under a really tight timetable because that Thursday, December 16th, rain was predicted. And as you'll see in some of the pictures that I'll share, there were large openings in our roof over our general assembly area. We needed to get the plant at least covered and closed before that rain came on Thursday the 16th. By the next Monday, the 20th, we got our team leaders back as we prepared. And on Wednesday, December 22nd, just 11 days later, we were building cars again. So I'm gonna take you through some of the details on that. So this storm system was a major system throughout the Midwest and the South. It tore 200 mile wreckage. Um, it was an EF3 tornado. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of homes, about 500 homes and about 100 businesses. And I was just awestruck when I saw the amount of damage and I was just, my heart went out to those families in our community that lost their home or lost their belongings um, due to this tornado. So the tornado um, hit kind of the west side of the building and it also ripped off part of the roof. So part of the roof was actually missing. Another part of the roof, it's a metal roof, was actually picked up and set back down. Well, you can imagine it didn't sit back down in exactly the same spot. So there were many, there were huge leaks, and then there were many small leaks. It wiped out uh, one of our gate number one and also one of our employee entrances, gate number four, our pump house. As, the, as we uh, started to assess, we saw more and more damage. So let me take you through the timeline. At the plant, we, we use AccuWeather and we get uh, information on our phones 
And so about 1.07 a.m., uh, AccuWeather said there's a tornado warning. So there, this is during the midnight shift, and we had about two dozen people there. So um, they were told to go to the shelter. We have a main, sh the main plant has a basement, and so there were some employees sheltered in the basement. And then also in our paint shop, we have the locker room, which is also a tornado shelter. So they got to the tornado shelter about 10 minutes before the tornado actually hit. So everybody was in their shelter and they were safe. Um, and it, after that tornado hit though, it came across that roof. And we have large air houses on top of the roof. One of those air houses was picked up and moved 12 feet. It ruptured a natural gas line, which caused a fire. So we not only had the damage of the tornado, we also had a fire to um, deal with. So let me tell you my, what, what happened uh, me personally. So I got the message, of course, that um, we needed to take shelter. And I got a phone call from our safety person who told me everybody's in the shelter and they're safe. Okay. Then Kai called me. Kai Spandy, our plant director, just happened to be in Ohio for the weekend. And he called and he said, hey, I heard the plant was hit. I said, yes, but everybody's in the shelter and they're okay. 10 minutes later, the phone goes again. We have a fire. I said, okay, I'm getting dressed. I'm coming in the plant. And then I, then I had a second phone call with Kai to say, yeah, the plant is on fire. Now, the tornado, at our house, the sirens were going off to take shelter, but we didn't have a whole lot of wind and we had rain. By the time I got dressed, this is, now it's about 2.15 a.m., so I got into my Corvette, Amplify Orange uh, convertible, <laughs> put that thing in the weather mode because it was raining and there was a lot, and by the time, at our house it wasn't too much rain, but as I drove to the plant, it was windy, the wind was still kicking up, and it was raining really, really hard. So it I actually usually takes me 20 minutes, it took me 30 minutes to get to work. So it's about 2.45 a.m., I'm, I'm coming north on 65, and I get off at exit 28 here, totally dark. I've been working at the, this plant almost eight years, I've never seen it, totally dark. The Shell Station, the Wendy's, no traffic lights, nothing. It's really kind of disorienting when it's so dark, it's just the headlights from the Corvette. So I turn right, I go up the hill, it's completely dark, that traffic light's also out. So I turn the corner, here comes the fire truck. The fire truck was just leaving. There was debris in the road, there's a big tree in the road, I just drove around it. I go by gate one, it's demolished. Okay, I'm not going in that gate. All right, and so I drive around to the front of the building. By that time, the emergency lighting is on. So I get rid of my things, and I get my safety gear, and I start my way outside the plant. And there is water everywhere in General Assembly, and it's raining inside the plant. So there was extensive flooding. All of GA was, was covered with water, the large openings that the tornado ripped up, it was just raining down. So I'm making my way. I actually had to go over by the body shop and back around just to make my way to the paint shop because the safety supervisor, um, Chuck was on his way in, uh, there was a shift leader, and my facilities manager were already on their way in. So we marshaled in the paint shop, and then we divided in teams of two and started to assess the damage. So outside damage, roof damage, I talked about the fire um, offices, general uh, assembly offices were flooded. And if you can imagine, and we'll look at, let, yeah, let me go back one. Over the, the picture at the top, yeah, I got a pointer, right? This is part of the roof. And you can say part of this is ripped off, and then there was just tons of, like, cuts by a thousand, right? There, it was just unbelievable. Well, this whole area here is part of General Assembly. In kind of the middle of General Assembly, uh, what we call the skillet line. So this is the point where the car has the carpet in. We're getting ready to put the seats in. We're putting the exterior panels on. 
but the car doesn't have a roof on it and the rain was coming down. So those cars were scrapped. Um, this, pic this lower picture is what we call our entrance number two. Here used to be a guard shack. It's not a guard shack anymore, but it just it gives you an idea of the amount of damage. I've got two short videos. These are from our camera system that's mounted on the, uh, outside the plant. So pay attention to these, these cars. You can see these cars here. And so there's lots of wind. This is 1.53 a.m. So the tornado has already hit, but still all the, the storm is continuing. And it's just blowing everything around. There's some debris. Saw the debris come down. There's more debris coming down. Just unbelievable the amount of, of debris. I think here right at the end. Now these cars are no nice, they're not parked nicely anymore. They actually collided and there was damage on those cars. And those were some of our employees' cars. All right, let's, let's see if I can. I'm gonna move to this second video. So take a look at these orange uh, barriers. And normally they are either filled with water or they're filled with sand to hold them down. This is 1.54 a.m. There they go. <laughs> it's gonna play again. You can see they just, Unbelievable, huh? Here's a sign that was found in Kissinger, Kentucky. It's 46 miles away. And that was one of our signs that was at the plant. And actually, uh, uh, one of the uh, shift leaders that works for Chuck, his, he had an acquaintance, they called, they said, I think we got your sign in, uh, out on our farm. It's just unbelievable, the, the, uh, that storm. Now, recovery efforts. So I talked about, you know, I arrived at the plant about 2.45. There were other staff members coming. Kai, when he, Kai Spandy, the plant director, he, he and Casey, they got in the car and they started driving here. So I think he arrived around 8.30. We took a whole layout of the uh, property and we started to circle where all the damage was. And when we did that, you could ex exactly see the path of the tornado. By mid-morning, we were on the phone with our headquarters folks. So the director for construction building, the manager for construction, the steel engineer, and the roof engineer. So we got on the phone, we sent them pictures, we told them the extent of the damage, and they started to go to work. They started to figure out, well, what what exactly is your roof material and what would we need and they got in a plane and by 3 30 saturday afternoon so this is december 11th the the, the morning that at, at the tornado had just hit those engineers they were here they were right here in bowling green and they went to the roof to assess the damage and lucky for us there was no steel structural damage but that is just an example. We had fantastic support. And this morning when Jordan Lee was talking about us as a company, and we had this saying, one team, this was definitely one team. They were there to help us. And what they did is they assessed what we needed as in, in the terms of resources, whether it was materials or people, and they really started to reallocate some of those resources so by Sunday, December 12th, we already had construction managers arriving at the plant. You know, we've got construction going down on Spring Hill, Tennessee at our plant there. And we also had construction at our Factory Zero in Detroit. And they relocated some of those resources and some of those people to come and help Corvette which is really cool that we had that fantastic support. There were over 22 different uh, contractors. There were at least five different roofing companies that were involved. At the peak, we had something like 362 workers there, so that's construction workers. 
and over 43,000 labor hours to start to put this thing back together. So we had the wall, we all had the upper level of part of the outside of the building was also missing along with the air houses, the one that I talked about that, that had caught on fire due to the natural gas line, but we also had other air handling houses that were damaged. Also, that large opening that I talked about in the in General Assembly, there was a busway, 300 foot busway that just got too much water intrusion. They, we could not dry it out. We needed a whole new busway for the middle of this GA area. So about a third of the GA area, we couldn't try out the equipment because we had no power. And it took time. This is a busway that's up overhead near the, you know, the ceiling of the plant. And it took time to replace that. But we got it, we got it done. We started to wring things out and dry things out. Uh, GM donated a million dollars to the Red Cross. So here in Kentucky and other states that were hit by this tornado were able to get some relief. Also, GM said, employees, if you'd like to donate, we have a system called GM Cares. So about $10,000 was donated personally by employees. So we partnershiped with the American Red Cross and also the United Way of Southern Kentucky. And I would tell you, during the time that the plant was down, as we were trying to get it covered up, get ready for that rain and trying to recover to get ready for production, our employees were out in the community helping their neighbors, helping other employees, because there were a lot of down trees, there was a lot of damage, so our employees were out there helping hands, um, doing a lot of work, while others of us were working to get the plant going again. Here's a picture of, and it was right before Christmas, so we went out and got a red bow for the car. This is the first car after we went through the other cars. Any car that had water intrusion, any parts that had water intrusion, we got rid of those parts. If it's a metal frame, okay, we didn't get rid of it. If, if it was carpet, if it was a seat, if it was interior, we scrapped it out. So we got those cars out of the way, and it took two shifts to get the first good car, and that came off on Wednesday, December 22nd. And I was amazed, because when they, when they first saw the damage, we said, well, how long do you think it'll take to get the plant running again? They said, three weeks. Made it happen in just over, over a week. So that was pretty amazing. But we took special care to ensure the highest quality, and we didn't keep any part. If it wouldn't go on my Corvette, it's not going on yours. OK, so just a summary again. Uh, it was 11 days between the initial impact of the tornado and we resumed normal production. It was truly amazing that one team coming together, it just, I can't say enough about the whole organization. I'm very proud of the plant and all the support people and the construction people to make that happen. Here's some photos. So this one at the top left, this is, uh, you can see this is water. This is water and this is damage with the water coming out and that is general assembly office area that I talked about. Here's an example of a car on the line that would not be okay because it got rain inside. We started to cover things up because we didn't know if we we're gonna get the openings in the roof covered by December 16th when the rain was coming. So we started and we also had to cover things up because we're gonna do construction to uh, fix the roof. Uh, but you can see, look how dirty. The floors aren't normally that dirty, but if anybody has been through flooding, it leaves a lot of debris. After we got rid of the water, we still had a lot of dirt. Here's an example of one of the cranes. We had multiple cranes. We had a crane on the north side of the plant. We had a crane on the sec south side of the plant because our roof has different elevations and we had different crews all working at the same time. This is our, our care line. 
Our care line didn't have any damage at all. So while we were getting things cleaned up, we covered up those cars to ensure that they would be okay. This is an example of electrical panel. We tried to dry things out what we could. We did have to replace motors. There was a pit area by the skillet area that um, some motors were submerged. They weren't designed to be submerged in water. So we were able to get those motors out and get those repaired um, before we started production. And then this is a picture from the roof. Okay, I like to make things fun, uh, and we have a couple prizes. So we have some travel mugs. Now it's not just simply a Corvette travel mug, it's a travel mug signed by Kai Spandy, the plant director, and the rest of the staff. So let's see who can answer this question correctly the fastest. Okay, the, the, the person uh, with the sunglasses and the hat uh, holding his phone up was the first person. Can you tell me what time the uh, tornado struck? 1.15 a.m. 1.15? No. <laughs> I don't know who was next. Blue shirt. 1.55? 35. 135. Okay, red shirt, blue hat. Uh, 130. 130. That's it. 130. Congratulations. Hope you like your travel mug. So keep paying attention because I got a couple more prizes. Couple. Let's see how. <laughs> Just trying to make it fun. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now, and we're going to talk about the Z06 LT6 engine. Again, I'm going to be focusing on the process as Jordan did a wonderful job sharing everything about the product of the LT6 engine um, earlier this morning. So I've got a little video. rev at the end. So I have to thank Evan Toms and Daryl Oakley and the rest of our PVC group who helped to put this video together. And there's a couple other videos in here and other information that they helped to put together. So I just want to make sure I recognize them. So Performance Build Center, you can see this is what we call our smart bench. You can see some of the equipment here. It's about 20,000 square feet for a performance build center within Bowling Green Assembly Plant, about 70 employee, hourly employees, 15 salary. Um, we're dedicated to high performance, low volume engines. It's what we are working on today is Cadillac CT5 V black wing, so that's an LT4 Gen 5. And we also make engines for Camaro. We actually make LT1 and LT4. And for 2023, we'll be making the Z06 engine. So most powerful, naturally aspirated engine, 5.5 V8 dual overhead cam, flat plane crank. It's the first time for a production, regular production engine to have a flat plane crank. And it really, and as Jordan talked about, there are some advantages to that flat plane crank. I love the exotic tone that we get from this engine, 670 horsepower at 8,400 RPMs and redlining at 8,600. And it's lighter than the LT4 engine. It is 31 pounds lighter than the LT4 engine and it's giving us 20 more horsepower. It's just, it's an amazing feat. Um, as we talked earlier, um, this performance build center, this, this is the only location that the LT6 engine will be built. It is hand assembled. So the assembler has an assembly cart and he 
he or she begins to uh, build the engine and they move from station to station and they build that entire engine and, then, and it takes about three and a half hours to do that, they are looking at every detail. They're inspecting those parts as they're assembling them because when they finish that assembly, they put their signature on that engine. So personalized signature placards um, for each of those, it's their stamp of approval, their name on the engine. Each of these workstations, so we, have, we call them smart stations. So here's the workstation. This is a torque tool. There's often a scanner there. This video screen has all the instructions needed. So it's not over here on the side, it's up on the screen. And if I wanna make it bigger, I can just zoom it out and make it bigger so that I can see it. It, it, it has all the steps so we ensure that we're following the proper sequence. If I skip a sequence, if I'm supposed to scan and I didn't scan that part, because we have traceability on many of the parts within the engine, and I didn't do it, it's not gonna let me proceed. So it's gonna ensure the, the, the quality. If there's additional information, maybe I wanna put another picture in there. I, it, this is real time, so I can just send that file and it's on the screen right there at the workstation. So it's much faster. Again, it, it ties in all of our air proofing, so you can't uh, skip any steps. Make sure all steps are complete. Um, it also tells us how much time. So if I'm supposed to work at this station in 20 minutes, it's gonna tell me, did it take me 19 minutes or did it take me 21 minutes? So it actually um, looks at the pace of what it's taking uh, to get those steps done. All right, now we're gonna talk about some new processes uh, for PVC and some unique processes to the LT6 engine. And one of the things we do is we hand assemble the uh, head subassembly. Oh, we lost our screen, what happened? Oh, okay, thank you. So um, every head is hand assembled. There's 140 pieces. And as we it was discussed this morning for you that were at uh, Jordan Lee's uh, presentation, it's mechanical lash. So it's the first production engine that's not the hydraulic lash, it's a mechanical lash. So we actually have to measure between the follower and that cam load and determine what gap there is and what size shim is necessary. So the first measurement happens um, when we first assemble the cam into the cam assembly and we measure it. And then we send that information to the robot. So the next station, it will get shuttled in where there's a robot and we've sent all the information so the robot knows I need this size shim. Let's go to the next. So each cylinder head has a, a unique shims. So it will pick, it will measure it, and it will install that shim in the robot. And this morning, uh, we said 31. There's actually 33 shim sizes. Now these, the increment between the shim size is 0 0.025 millimeters or two and a half microns. That's, for those thinking in inches, it's a thousandth of an inch. That is smaller than the thickness of a human hair. So it's very precise, and there's 33 different sizes that um, the robot could select. Let's see if we can make this video. So this is the video, it's showing where the uh, robot is gonna pick up. The shim is like the size, if you had, hearing aids and you had a battery for a hearing aid, that's about the size of the shim, okay? So there's four per cylinder, four cylinders per head, two heads, so there's 32 shims per engine. Okay, amazing. So cylinder heads, uh, so I talked about how we measure it 
and then we send the head to the robot that will automatically pick the right shim. Then after that, there's another station where we have to put the, the uh, cams back in and we're gonna remeasure it. And we're gonna verify before it leaves the head subassembly that we've got the right size shim. Okay, now it's gonna go over to what we call the main line where we're gonna assemble the head onto the engine. And guess what? <laughs> we gotta take the cams back off in order to get to the bolts to bolt the head down to the engine. So then we're gonna put the cams back on and we're gonna measure it a third time. So we measure it initially, we install the shims, then we check it again, and then when it's uh, assembled on the engine, we check it a third time. Now, what was said this morning, and I, I also know to be true, is this is lash for, for life. There's no service required. Not like maybe the old days with track engines that you might need to do that. This is uh, one time and you're there for life. Okay, another feature that is unique to the LT6 is that we select fit the bearings. And these are bearings for the connecting rod and the bearings for the main bearings. So the precise dimensions of the crank and the block, and this morning we talked about it's a two-piece block, right? There's an upper crank case and a lower crank case, and the pistons. So all that data is collected by the suppliers that machine these parts, and they store all that data on a 2D matrix. So they send that to us. So this is the end of the crank. This is where the 2D matrix is. So this is kind of a blow up so you can see. On that 2D matrix is all the data required for the sizes. So if it's on the crank for the pins and the main, all those diameters for the crank, uh, the bore for the block where these bearings are gonna go, and also the piston rods. And it sends the, all that data as we scan this uh, 2D matrix, it sends the data to the smart bench. And then the smart bench says, okay, based on that, this is the size bearing needed. So on, there's a pick light in the container and it says pick that bearing. Okay, we pick that bearing and we're gonna install it. But we're not gonna end there, right? We're gonna check it after you install the bearing. So I've got a picture of that. I got a little video to, sh to help uh, let me go back. Let me hit. Well, there's supposed to be, oh, now it's running. Good. Because what this is doing, it's showing how the light screen from the smart bench, it's, it drove the pick light. It pick the correct bearing, you install it, and now it's going to scan it because there's a little tiny 2D matrix on that bearing and it's gonna say, yes, you picked the right bearing. So it's gonna verify when the bearing is inside the block that the correct bearing was installed. He's gonna do that for each one, he or she will do that for each one of the bearings, including the thrust bearing. That's a thrust bearing assembly. So it's the main bearing, but that one comes as an assembly between the bearing and the thrust. And he's gonna do that for both the upper crankcase and the lower crankcase. Okay, RTV station. So as we talked about the upper and the lower crankcase, we gotta put those two uh, halves together and we use RTV, which is room temperature vulcanizing adhesive to when we apply it to the lower crankcase. Well, during this robot that applies the adhesive, we do more than that. We're, we're gonna actually check, go back and check and ensure that the adhesive height, the thickness, the width, and the conformity is correct. We're also going to look at those lower main bearings and also the gaskets to make sure that those are present and correct. And I do have a video. Let's see if I can make it work. Here we go. So 
So it is, what it's doing right now, it, it's applying that RTV. What it also in this head is the camera. And after it applies the RTV, it will go back and look at the conformity, the height, the width of the bead, and then it will also look at the bearings and it will look to make sure that these gaskets are present. So that's part of the uh, airproofing in the station. Uh, each one of our engines gets a final inspection called, we call care. Um, it's a different um, team member than the team member that built the engine, so there's a good check and balance there. They also do some weight, some torque checks, they check the manifold, they make sure that all the tests were done properly, and they do some visual inspection. And what's, again, unique about the LT6 is each one of these engines then will be shipped to a local source Will they'll have a dynamic loaded test. So it's a 20 minute test and it just gives us a chance to run the engine in. Um, I don't have a lot of data on that. This, this is the same um, chart that maybe you saw this morning around torque and speed and horsepower. Um, so those are the standard curves, but we're gonna run that engine at different speeds um, and at different loads. And we're gonna validate that it is ready for the customer. That would be interesting and I will take that feedback. But I don't think that's planned at the, uh, this time. But we also, we put a dye in the oil, and as we run it, then we check it with a black light to ensure that there's no leaks. But then we change the oil, and we change the filter. So when you get your engine, you're getting an engine with new oil and a new filter. When that uh, test machine is running, whoops, let me go. When that test machine is running, uh, it w we have a very green initiative at uh, GM, and we're gonna, um, by supplying the regenerative power from that test stand back to the electrical grid. Okay, it's time for another question. Oh, somebody's getting ready. Okay, here's the question. How much lighter is the LT6 compared to the LT4? And in the blue and white shirt there, you're, you're the first up. 31, 31 pounds, very good. Hope you enjoy this hat. Again, that was signed by the uh, plant director and the plant staff. All right, <laughs> good, glad you like it. Um, now I'm gonna go to the third topic, which is we're gonna talk about the new colors for this year and ever expanding palette. It is the first time ever that we're gonna offer 14 different colors. And we have two, two new colors and it's also the very first time ever that we will offer a tri-coat. So the pearl metallic uh, is actually a tri-coat. And then we'll also, we also have the carbon flash. So two new exclusive colors for this year, the white pearl metallic and the carbon flash metallic. And so I know there are cars out in our display area, and I gotta tell you, when you get them out in the light, that metallic just really pops. But Chuck brought some parts here, so we have the carbon flash and then we have the white metallic, uh, white pearl metallic, sorry, uh, that uh, is here, if you wanna come up a little bit closer uh, to take a look at those. So there's the white pearl metallic and the carbon flash metallic. Also for the 70th anniversary, a new interior color, this ceramic with red, which you can get with the GT2 and also the Comp Sport seats. So those are our, our 12 colors that we have now, plus the two additional makes 14. First time ever that we've, we've offered 14 colors. 
All right. What year was the Z06 first introduced? Oh, I need, I'm going to try to call somebody in that section, white shirt, waving. Yes, you. 63, yes, 1963. I will always remember that because that's also the year with the split window. All right. All right, that is, concludes all my formal presentation. Uh, hopefully we have time for some questions. Uh, were all of the, uh, the plant employees that were at home, were they all okay? Yes, they were all okay, but some of them lost some of their personal items, and some of them had to move. There were a couple in apartments where their apartment was destroyed, and they had to move. So, Thank But yes, no, no, no injuries, and um, everybody was okay as far as plant employees. What happened, <clears throat> what happened to the cars that were across I-65 at the track? and the building over there. Okay, so I guess I think it's okay for me to answer. That, those cars that were over at the track were belonged to the museum as they were preparing for um, museum delivery. So they, they weren't actually the plant's cars. Um, so I'll, I'll let somebody from the museum answer uh, that one, okay? Plant tours, tell us about that. I'm sorry? Plant tours, are they coming back anytime soon? Oh, plant tours. This is the number one. I probably should have just started this whole presentation <laughs> with that. And unfortunately, I don't have a date. We really want to have the customers in the plant. It, we have such pride in our plant, but it's even better when we have the customers line side. So we really want to do that, but we really gotta see what's going on with COVID. Is this gone? I mean, we were in masks for almost two years, and I work 12 hours a day. Chuck works a lot of hours. That's a long time to be in a mask every day, and it was almost two years. So we're happy that we're not wearing masks, and we hope that it lasts but we're not ready to, to open up um, to the public yet. Nora, Steve Garrett from the Corvette Today podcast. With the engine build, will that be available immediately when the Z06 starts down the line? Um, not immediately, but as soon as we can, we will start uh, that as far as the build your own engine. It has been announced that we're gonna do that, but no details around it yet. Yeah, Nora, uh, I'm sorry if I may be late with this, but what's the latest status of what was reported last year as a potential work stoppage? Potential work stoppage. Well, I would. Oh, no issue. No issue there. It's been settled. We are we are building every day, and we're working together. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so that that it's it's really what what is stopping us is. COVID and our supplier is dealing with COVID. And unfortunately, you know, I think you probably all know we're not building this week because of supplier. So the downtime is related to supplier. It's not related to the work uh, groups as far as the union. So electrified cars require a totally different training situation in a plant, handling batteries, handling electric motors and tying things together. Even at dealerships, they have to go through a right. totally ex extensive set of training so they don't get hurt. Yep. So that, has that process started within your well, bandwidth? Let me, let me talk about some of the sister plants like Spring Hill that also builds electric cars. They build the Cadillac Lyric. And so there is um, defined training programs that GM has for all employees, and then some more extensive training for those employees that would do any repair on an electric car. So that would be true in Spring Hill, where they're building the Lyric, or at Factory Zero, where they're building the Hummer. So yeah, we are. there's already training programs um, designed uh, for any of the plants that would be building electric cars. Question the about- The training program is available. I don't have details on, on what's going on. 
question about product pipeline that's already been announced and uh, the challenges around what you just mentioned around uh, supplier and, and uh, supply chain and all that. Lots of demand for these products, as you know. Um, is there any plans to, to address uh, multiple suppliers for some of the uh, constrained parts? We, I have to recognize the army of people that we have in the Detroit area that is monitoring our parts for Corvette and parts for all of GM. So when we think about what happened with COVID or what happened with earthquakes, um, there, there are um, looking at alternate suppliers, um, expediting, and um, we, for Corvette, we're being taken care of. You know, they're, they're ensuring that, all, that we can build as, mon as many as possible. We have sometimes some unique Corvette parts that also can be a roadblock for us. But again, we look at alternate suppliers, and we have that, that team that is working many long hours uh, to keep, keep us in parts our plant and other GM plants. What are you doing to address increasing daily production to see an end to the light of the tunnel with to, the demand? I, I'm, so what I'm saying, my question is, are you doing anything to increase daily production so that you know, you've been on back order before you started and mm -hmm. is there, when do you envision the light at the end of the tunnel that your, your supply will meet the demand. It, it's really going back to those supply parts. So we are building, if bring the parts, we'll build the cars. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I look at last year and I look at what happened this week and another week this year, it's all been around the supply parts. So getting back to alternate sources and working on those constraints of those suppliers um, because we're not able to build on the first eight hours, and we have two shifts, right, before we can think about additional hours to try to make up that backlog. So right now, bring the parts, we're gonna build the cars. Chuck, I have a question for you. Talk about, right here, talk about the white pearl tricoat. How difficult is that to make and produce and process? Okay, um, it is hard. I mean, it's the first time we've done a tri-coat. We couldn't do it in the old paint shop. When we built the new one, we facilitized it to do this. It's just we wanted to get through launch and through C8 launch and all those things before we did it. But what you really have with this uh, color, and the reason we call it a tri-coat, it gets its color position from all three layers. So there's a white prime under here. And so if we would use gray, which is the default color, this would be a different color, be substantially darker. But then normal, normal colors, you just put a base and then you put clear over top of it. With this, there's in a sense two base coats that are used on this, a ground and a mid coat. And they are two different shades and there's a metallic in one of them. And the reason we do it this way is kind of we want to get that fluorescent look where we want you to be able to see through it in a sense to see the band of color that's in it. It also looks different depending on what light it's in. Like in here, it looks a little darker. It doesn't look as bright. But when you see it out there, it's much lighter. It's much brighter. And then you'll really see the metallic in it. We were really excited. This was the first time we were able to bring you the cars with the new colors. Like normally, we just have these panels, and that's all we have. Uh, we were able to get far enough ahead that we could build these cars in time to get them as part of this uh, so people could see them. But it is, uh, this is a lot more difficult uh, to paint. It takes up extra systems in our, our plant, in our mix room. Um, and then of course it takes longer for us to paint that because you paint it like you would a normal car and then the robots have to come back and load up with the next base layer to come in uh, and then in the flash off oven before they get clear coated. So it is a lot harder to paint it, but. I'm a big fan of it. People have been asking us for this for quite a while, so hopefully you guys like it and people are gonna buy this. It is a, a hard one to paint, but I think it looks looks really good. Nora, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, your presentation today right here. I don't know if you can oh, see me. But, I couldn't see you. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. It's great. Uh, back to the tornado. Um, how many complete cars were uh, scrapped and and uh, were there complete cars that were scrapped? 
there were cars that were in process uh, that did not have the panels on them that got water damage. So any of the ones that got water damage, we scrapped. And uh, it took two shifts to get those uh, cars offline. So I'm not going to give you a number, but let me reassure you or ensure you that we did everything. We thought about the customer, and if there was any doubt, we said we're not going to use that part or we're going to scrap that car. So, um, yeah. There was a question up front here, and I know you didn't get a chance to ask. Oh, okay, so 480 volts is typical for machinery to run on. So overhead, we have this electrical that's going to then drop down to all the different conveyors and equipment below. So it, uh, we have substations that will step it down to the 480 volts and then down to the actual power distribution panels at the machines, and those typically run at 480 volts. So it's a higher voltage, and it's um, supplying 300 feet worth of equipment. Nora, oh, over here. My, yeah. my question is that now that you're building the right-hand drive cars for Japan and Europe, how are they built in the plant? Do you batch build them in groups, or are they mixed in amongst the United States or Canadian built cars. Right, so right-hand drive, it, it, it does take um, some different, uh, unique steps, and uh, we do batch build them once a week. So if I'm a team member and I'm, I'm building and it's like, oh yeah, now I gotta go to right-hand drive. Okay, let's do those in a batch. So it's more helpful to the team member if we, we put those right-hand drives together. It also helps our material organization because there's some unique parts. So they can take the left-hand parts out and they can put the right-hand specific parts in place. So yes, we do batch bill once a week. I, I have a question on uh, the supply chain. You know, it's impacting many, many industries. Yeah. And what I wonder about is, you know, you've had a couple work stoppages because of so supply and chain issues and parts. Are you concerned at all? Do you have any problems with quality control? Uh, because those suppliers are being pressed also. And then you got the further labor issues and everything. Because we I've seen it in just other items. And I just wonder mm -hmm. if you're running into that with cars and you have to reject parts and that slows up the process. Well, I would tell you that we have a lot of uh, hundreds, hundreds of electric tools so any of those fasteners, we're going to ensure that those are correct. We have also for the instrument panel, we have testing that's done. Uh, we download the software and then we're, we're checking um, all of the functions inside the car. And then we do the alignment and then we do a dynamic vehicle test. And there are literally thousands of things that we're checking. So, we do, we do find things so that you don't have that problem. So yeah, that, that's part of what we're all dealing with. I would tell you that I'm a lot more optimistic now. I'm seeing, I know we're down this week, but uh, it was kind of uh, uh, not related directly to COVID. Um, I am more optimistic that we're getting more stability we're getting more stability in our workforce, and uh, that's good for the people and it's good for the car. So I'm, we're, we're starting to see some stability. Another Chuck question. How long ago was the decision made for the white pearl metallic and the black? So how long did that give you to get these done? Well, <clears throat> There's, there's two stages really of getting them done. There's the conceptual work and the formulation work that goes into making the, the, I say can of paint, but we get the toad of paint that they give us. And then we then that happens and we make sure like the long-term durability testing and all those things and UV is done. And then it comes to us and we do a lot of testing. This was a lot of programming. We had to reprogram for this to do the, the tri-coat. Um, 
and then you know we run several iterations of it, then we've got to do a lot of testings. Um, if you hit a home run with it, it's shorter. If we have to make some formulation adjustments to get it to where we want it to look, then it takes us longer. Um, just as an example, we're starting now the process for 24 colors. I know I'm not going to tell you what those are, but, but that will tell you. And the decision's already made. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it isn't. It's already made. We know what they are. Um, and we're starting the work now to get those ready. Does it take us a year to do it from start to finish? Yeah, we're a little bit north of a year. I mean, we're already talking about what's 25. So we usually start the process about two years out, then gets hot and heavy one year out to actually do it. Nora, Chuck, this will be your all's last question. I found it very interesting when you were talking about the people making the engines and that it's one person. Curious about the training process, how long that takes, uh, do they have certain quotas, but it seems yep. like the precision and the training just, just must be a, very involved. Yes, it is. So if, if you want to work in the performance bin, uh, build center, you apply and you actually go through an interview process. Some of our builders have built their own engines and they're very familiar with it and then others have never built an engine before. So somebody that's very familiar with it, uh, all of our new builders will work with an experienced builder. So it could take that person maybe six weeks or it could take somebody up to three months before they are, have learned all of the steps. Um, can you imagine three and a half hours worth of work? There's a lot of steps involved. Of course, we have the smart benches and it's gonna help them. Uh, but yeah, it, it's um, a really tremendously proud of uh, the PBS uh, P PBC, oh, I watch PBS a lot. <laughs> the Performance Build Center employees and uh, the engine builders is truly uh, amazing uh, what they do. I'm really proud of, of the team. So anywhere from six weeks to three months, depending on the individual. That was it. So thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>